first or our inaugural Breakfast with the Expert Lecture for uh, the 14-15 academic year. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Mr. Brent Cummings. Uh, Brent is the Value Optimization System Director at Johnson City Medical Center. So Voss is the quality improvement, lean thinking arm of Mountain State's Health Alliance. He's going to talk a lot more about that, but you guys that are, have been in quality improvement or are going to be in quality improvement or lean thinking, it is everything. It is a hot, hot topic in healthcare right now. <coughs> so Mr. Cummings is actually an alum of ETS College of Business and Technology. He got his BBA and his MBA from there. He also has his professional and uh, human resources uh, certificate, which is actually a very uh, rigorous and very well recognized certificate. And that's something I'd like to ask you a little bit more about when we get a chance. Yeah. Um, but he, his lean uh, journey began in 2012, where he uh, entered Voss. He's since then led teams, uh, uh, extended the uh, lean thinking methodology throughout JCMC, and continues that work today. So, with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. I lost the front row crowd here. Um, all right, so <laughs> before we get uh, started, I just want to get a little pulse check of, of the room to see, I guess, what, what you guys currently understand about lean. So let's talk about when we say lean, what's, what's the words that come to mind um, that describe lean as far as what you guys understand it to be? What, what are some of those things? There's no wrong answer. I'll spin it. I promise. I'll spin it to where it's correct. If you're not the waste, uh, waste. Yeah. Waste. Eliminating waste. What else? Do what? <laughs> well, if you lean over the table, yes. Um, but, but yeah. What, a, what about uh, streamlining? Eliminating waste. What else? Well, well, good. We're going to learn a lot about lean today. Um, yes, absolutely. What else? Efficiency. Right here we go. We're starting to come around. Anything else? I think of the Japanese. They kind of like in your title here, the Toyota. Yeah. There, there's a backstory to that, and I'll, I'll, pro I'll get to that here in a second. But uh, how many of you guys have heard that lean is a growth strategy? Anybody? Raise your hands. Has anybody ever heard that lean, lean is a growth strategy? All right. Then we're going to learn a lot about lean today. Um, so the title, you know, lean, you know, that, that Toyota thing, a, a funny backstory is, you know, when lean first came out, you know, how they got um, to the name lean, you know, John Walmack and others, they wanted, they knew it was so special, you know, what Toyota was doing in the Toyota production system, you know, they, they thought that that was so special, it deserved its own name. So they sat around the table and they just started listing out words on a flip chart. You know, what is lean to them? What is it? It's less this, less that, less time, less effort, um, it's more efficiency, streamline, this, that, and the other. And they came up and said, well, it sounds pretty lean to me. And that's what they called it, because they, they didn't, because at the time, back in the 80s, um, you know, a lot of organizations had, the, I guess, the uh, tendency to name things after people <coughs> or places. So that instead of just having people say, well, now I don't want to do that Toyota thing, they decided to call it lean. It was something uh, new and exciting and special. So. Um, so we'll get into what is Lean. So it is, it's a business management system focused on continuous improvement. Um, and, and actually, like I said before, with the growth strategy, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But it creates more value with less everything. So less time, less effort, fewer errors. You know, everybody, you know, took that, you know, and missed the it creates more value part. So they, they kind of missed the part that you it creates a more perfect value for your customer, and then you decide from the customer's perspective what is waste, and you eliminate that. But you don't just eliminate waste, whatever is wasteful for you or your organization. It's what's waste in the eyes of the customer. So, um, like we said, it identifies and eliminates waste or non-value added steps, and we'll get into that here in a little bit too. Um, improves quality of patient care and outcomes. It improves education and team member growth. 
um, and it promotes the root cause problem solving. So it's not just a bunch of firefighting and you know people point to a problem and we'll go fix it real quick. Um, that's that's the naughty F word and and lean that we don't uh, want to ever use. We don't we don't ever fix things. We solve things. So what lean is not, um, it's definitely not an initiative to reduce the workforce. A lot of people heard the less, 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 and they just assume that means less team members or less employees, and it's quite the opposite. It's not all about cutting cost. Of course, cost is, is one of the things that is kind of a byproduct of doing process improvement. Um, it's not a system that promotes firefighting styles of uh, uh, problem solving, and it's definitely not a quick fix. Um, you know, when we're talking about processes that have been ingrained in our cultures for, for years, it's very painstaking to get that um, overturned and, and kind of learn what we need to learn and, uh, and change the culture. And it's definitely not easy to do, um, and it can be quite painful for some. So why, why can it be quite painful for some? Why do you guys think change is so painful? This is going to be a very interactive <laughs> presentation. Why would change be painful? New. It's new. Why would that matter? Why don't we like new? Because we're very comfortable with what we wear. Right. Right. If if I told everybody that everybody this morning was going to be forced to take a different route to the school, how would that feel? <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. You wouldn't want to do it. What if I said, but there's no red lights? There's no red lights at all. Yes, it's it's two miles longer, no red lights, speed limit's a little less, but I promise you, you're going to get there faster. What would you think? Trust me, you problem. Yeah, you wouldn't trust me. You wouldn't trust me. You have to do it for yourself. You have to kind of show, well, we have to show people the value in what we do in order to get their buy-in to be able to do what we need them to do or what they should be probably already doing in the first place. So uh, we'll get into the value optimization system philosophy, and it's, it's still based on the lean uh, methodology. So it's based on two simple concepts. So we've got respect for people, patients or customers, and society, and continuous improvement. And, and it's as simple as that. So respect for all people. Don't treat anybody and don't have them do tasks or, or anything like that that you wouldn't have your own mother do. Um, you know, Respecting patients or customers by understanding what, what they value and trying to deliver deliver that value as efficiently as possible. Uh, and of course, having that culture of continuous improvement. So, so always being, getting up in the morning and saying, why can't today be better than yesterday? You know, it should be at least a little bit better. And then the true north metrics, we'll co we're going to cover some of the real quick basics before we get into the real lean, um, lean uh, approach. So true north metrics, these, these are, um, you know, the, like the north star in the sky, these are what guides us on the lean team um, or any kind of quality improvement and stuff. So we got human development, uh, which is just imp improved capacity at all levels. So the human development is kind of the, the me metric. It's, it's how do we develop and grow and motivate our own employees and team members? How do we give them the best training so that they're, be they're best prepared for when they go do the job? And then you got quality, so zero defects, no defects at all ever. So how many how many of us right now believe that zero defects is achievable? In what? In let's just say let's just say healthcare. No defects. Well, you, you've been through through Voss, so of course you believe it. So why don't we believe zero defects is achievable? Nobody's ever seen zero defects. Right. And not in healthcare anyway. But you're also dealing with such a human component in healthcare. Because not, you know, when, you, when you're looking at outcomes, you, know, you, you and I may not have the same outcome from the exact same surgery because <coughs> genetically we're different, biologically we're different, you know, who knows what it may be. Right. Uh, I, I just, and you're, you're dealing with, as opposed to people on a conveyor belt receiving health care, you know, robots providing it, you're dealing with people who have different levels of expertise or I know you don't want to hear some training. No, education. no. 
Yeah. There's variation. Yeah, there's you know, variation. The variation leads to the, the unevenness in the process. The unevenness leads to the waste, and the waste that leads to the defects that we see. Um, you know, but it wasn't that long ago when you know when we went out to start our cars that we didn't feel that sense of gosh, I hope this thing starts this morning. You know, but but what if today you you went to start your car and it didn't start? I mean, how would you feel? That would be complete surprise. You'd be like, what? How does that happen? You know, it's it's that zero defects mentality. So we can we can get to zero defects. It's just we have to understand that we have to have continuous improvement. We always have to find ways to innovate and find new ways of doing things and and decrease the variation in our processes. So that way the outcome is so reliable it just happens and it's error proof to where no defects reach reaches the end customer. Um, timeliness, so we look at timeliness too. Um, so how how timely do we deliver that product service or or whatever that customer is there for? Um, and then cost, you know, we talked about 100% value added, and we'll get get into the the definition of value added here in a little bit. And then there's your growth and capacity. So how we how we work our way down through there is um, in typical in a typical business environment, where do we focus on the most? out of these five. So in your, you run a business, your business, what are you going to focus on the most? Cost. cost. Does everybody agree? Yeah, we run to the cost, right? How much is it going to cost us? Well, what happens when we run to the cost and put all our focus and effort into cost? What happens to our quality? I heard it goes down. Why does it go down? Because you're not focused on it, because you're cutting corners, because you're doing a lot of different things, right? Well, then, okay, so now we're going to go fight the quality fire. So we're going to go back up to quality and focus all on quality. So what's going to happen to our cost when we do that? goes right back up. So so we're in that never-ending cycle, right? Have you ever solved a problem and you turn around six months later, you go, God, why, we just talked about this. We just solved this problem. Well, that's because we didn't have the standard work. We didn't have the processes in place to keep it balanced before we run off and, and go to the next problem. But the way the lean approach is, the way we approach it is um, we focus on human development first. Um, and, and that's and their list. These these metrics are listed in this order for a reason. They're they're in order from most important to to kind of the things you get for free. Um, and an example of that. So what if what if we just focused on human development? So what if we just focused on if this is our business and everybody in here is an employee? So what if we just focused on on creating the most highly trained, motivated. Um, staff that we could ever imagine. We just put all our eggs in that basket. So now that we have highly capable people, what is going to happen to quality as a result? What are you going to be able to do as an employee if you're highly trained and know, know the job that you're doing, better trained than any other organization out there? What's going to happen to the quality that you're able to deliver? It's going to go up. It's going to go up. But we didn't work on it, but it's just going to go up. So quality increases. So what? So if quality happens, there's not as many defects. There's not as much rework. We don't have to keep doing processes over and over and over again. What happens to the timeliness that we're able to deliver that product? It's going to go up. And then, so if our quality, quality and timeliness have improved, then what's going to happen to our cost? How, what's going to happen to the, how much it costs us to produce that? It's going to decrease, right? Because we're not doing the rework, we're not spending all that money doing it over and over and over. So if our cost is good, and, and we're able to provide quality, timely, um, care products or whatever we're talking about. What happens to the growth or the, at least the capacity to do business? What's going to happen? It's going to increase. But we never even looked at it. We focus on human development. So that's why the people aspect and lean is so important. I mean, you can't do lean without great people, and you can't do definitely can't do lean without fantastic leadership. It just it will fail every single time. Um, yeah. 
So, so kind of what I was struggling with on the people side. So I, I, I agree with that. A common quality uh, mistake I think that we make in healthcare is that we always end it with education. I think you and I even talked about that one time. Every time I would work with my clinicians, it would be like it would, it would say in our quality improvement process, it would end with educating our nurses on, mm -hmm. on something. Yeah, we just need to communicate better. Is, 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 is that human development? Because that always seemed like a, a mistake. How, how, do you, how do you rectify that? Well, that would be empowering the team to figure out what pro what is the least waste way to do their, their processes. What's the most customer-centric way to do this this job? And then challenge them to not stop at the, the education communication answer, but let's go one step further and, and really understand what the root cause of that problem is and error-proof the, the process. No different than when you guys go out and pump gas. I mean, do, is it really a painstaking process to pump gas? But why? I mean, you know, if you all wanted to put diesel fuel in your car, could you do it? If you had an unleaded car? Is that possible? Has anybody ever tried? <laughs> So if you do try, it, it just won't happen. Uh, the nozzle won't fit. So instead of instead of the gas companies going, gee, I wonder how we can get people from goofing up and blowing their engines um, and putting diesel fuel in the car by accident, let's not just educate people. Let's just airproof it. Let's change the nozzle size so that way it makes it kind of foolproof. You can't do it. And that's just by empowering the the people to make their own decisions and and. Uh, you know, have better outcomes. Does that kind of answer? Yep. You know, so empower the team to make make their own own decisions. Easier said than done. Not everything's like pumping gas. Um, the other thing that we go by, and this is a real quick slide, so transformational learning requires deep personal experience. So you can't do lean um, in, the, in the office, you can't do it um, in the classroom. It's it's learn by doing approach. Um, and you guys can, can read the slides. Um, and of course, the answers are all none, all right? I mean, Michael Phelps didn't read a single book. He, he was probably told at some point in life to sink or swim, and he swam pretty good, so he kind of followed, followed that, uh, that path. Um, and the way we get people involved is, is through rapid improvement events. So rapid improvement events are the week-long uh, Kaizen events that we do um, that gets all the frontline experts to the table and kind of takes them through this problem-solving methodology. So we always uh, preach to uh, engage the world's greatest experts, the people that actually do the job. You know, it's, I, I can have the greatest idea in the world, but I don't ever do the job. So it could never be as good as an idea that a frontline team member has. It just won't, because I never do the job. Um, all right, so let's get into some lean thinking. So, so real quick, the five principles of lean thinking are value. Like we said, the customer defines the value. And we'll get a little bit more into that here in a second. Um, and value stream. So once we know what the value is, um, then we got to identify what parts of the system or the business delivers that value um, and which parts are waste. So we'll go through a value stream and kind of map out all the different processes and identify which are waste and which are value added. Um, flow, of course, uh, redesign the system in the least waste way to allow uh, the value to flow um, under the like a stream or a river. Um, pull, we'll, and we'll get into all these one by one. Uh, pull, deliver uh, to meet the real customer demand. So instead of backing or instead of a push method where um, you know I'm just giving you gobs of forms, but you only need one um, at any given time, and it might be another month before you touch that form again. Instead of printing out a thousand forms and laying them on your desk, I let I let you pull them. They're print on demand. You click and print as you need them. You know, so so that kind of methodology throughout everything that we do. And perfect, you know, so zero defects on the perfection side, uh, relentless pursuit of perfection um, is kind of the guidelines that we go by. So what is really value? Um, so number one, the customer must think that the task is important, you know, of course. Uh, and what we always say is, is the customer willing to pay for it. Um, so if you've got an itemized bill, um, and, and don't forget, everything that we do, no matter what, it, it adds cost. And if all of us were to get a detailed bill from the last time uh, 
um, that we took an airline trip somewhere, you would see all the little things, you know, this is how much it costs you to check in, this is how much it costs you to go through security, this is how much it costs you to get your bags checked. Um, so when we think about, you know, flying somewhere, what what is the, the part that is value to you guys? What part of that process is valuable? Do I? Safety, okay, absolutely. So that's one piece. But what about waiting for that that security check? So you don't want to wait for it. You just want it. Okay. We're going to get charged for the waiting part too. But what else? What other steps are valuable? I think they are on time. Right, on time arrival. You know, so we we talk about. You know, the gate time, I guess, you know, it's valuable that we get pushed back when we when we expect it to be pushed back. Wheels up to wheels down, um, that's all going to be valuable. Uh, to us. That's why we went to the airport, right, to fly. Um, but we didn't go in lines to wait at check-in counters, uh, wait at the security lines, wait, 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 um, wait for our flights to be delayed and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we have to be willing to pay for it. So, you know, if you if you saw security cost, you know, forty five dollars of your flight, would you willingly pay for it, or would you say, you know what, just remove that step, and we'll just wing it. We'll just kind of go, <laughs> and go out and just hope hope we get there. So, absolutely not. You know, there, but there's a certain amount that we're willing to pay for and what we're not. If it costs you $400 to go through security, would you question that? Probably. Somebody in here would say, ah, that's ridiculous. I'll check. I'll let me check everybody for $400 and I'll get paid for that. Um, so, value adding tasks must physically change the information or outcome. So, any activity that positively and directly changes the condition of a patient, service, or a product. Is typically value added, and the task must be done right the first time. So continuous loops of checks and rechecks, and double, triple checks, and double, triple final checks aren't value added steps. That becomes the waste part of the process. Um, and typically, what we see that is is about nine parts waste to one part value added. So about 90% of what we do in any typical business environment, especially in healthcare, is about 90% non-value added and about 10% is what um, customers will actually willing to pay for. So. so when we get into how we define value, um, you know, which is the first step of, of what we do in Lean is just understand what the value is from the customer's perspective. We use the Kano model. Um, and it's real, real simple to understand. You know, we got customer satisfaction um, there on the left, and whether you're uh, annoyed, neutral, or delighted uh, with satisfaction, and then whether or not product and service features are are either absent or present. And so we break them down into three different categories. We got basic, which are unspoken type. Of, um, Product or service features. We've got performers, and then we got delighters. So when we when we talk about the basic, uh, which are unspoken, those are the things that just really get on your nerves um, when they don't happen correctly. So um, so the last time you guys were at at a hotel, you know, when you go to a hotel, what are some basic needs that you feel like the Hampton Inn should provide? So if these things were absent, you would just be furious. What are some What are some basic hand soap? Yeah, just toiletries type stuff. What about sheets on the bed? Clean sheets on the bed, I guess. Um, empty room when you get there. You know that kind of stuff. You know, so those those things those things are the basic basic things. Um, what about performers? So performers are our specified things, and they. Um, um, kind of set you apart from one hotel to the next. So we think about the uh, Motel 6 versus the Hilton. You know, there's some performers that, that you get at, I guess, higher end uh, resorts. Larger room. Larger room, whatever bed you want, whether jacuzzi, tub, ocean view, you know, those kind of kinds of things. 
Um, what about delighters? Now these are unspoken and sometimes you know, we have to kind of guess or take a stab at what what the customer wants. You know, in the cell phone industry, this is, I mean, every time they come out with a new iPhone, right, they got all kinds of different features and they don't know which which ones are going to be delighters or which are not, which are going to fumble. Um, so what about um, the delighters? What, what do hotels have or some hotels have that just blow you guys away? Concierge service. Yep, concierge, valet parking. Warm cookies and chicken. Warm cookies. Hey, when they have those, they're all gone. They're all gone. Um, yeah, so all those things are delighters. Now, now what happens to that value over time, though, is, um, and, it's, and you can look at automobiles, you can look at any hotels, um, anything, is we'll start on, if we identify a delighter, we'll start on that curve, but what happens to those delighters over time? Because there was a point in time where a delighter in a, in a car was leather seating, right? And a cassette tape was a delighter at some, at some point. What are delighters now for a car? Expectations. Yeah, and the expectations change. So once you deliver a delighter, it's gonna move down. Now the pace that it moves down, it's it's kind of up to the industry, but it will move down to a performer, and performers will become basics. So that's why in lean, it's always that's why continuous improvement matters because we have to outpace ourselves. We have to outrun the competition every single time we turn around. So that's kind of that why the human development um, aspect is so important to what we do. Um, so once we've defined the value, now now it's time to kind of classify it. Is it value added or is it waste what we do? So in the, the eyes of the customer, everything that we do either adds value or does, does not. So that's kind of hard for some people to kind of grasp. But the definition of value adding, like we said before, any activity that directly contributes to satisfying the needs of the customer. And anything non-value added is anything that, that consumes time or resources but doesn't add value. So that's kind of how we identify the waste. So we break the waste down in, into eight um, categories. These, this is the 10P wood. Have you guys talked about 10P wood in class before? Crickets. Well, we're going to talk about 10P wood today. So um, we, the eight categories, and I think most people should have an eight waste observation form, and that will make sense here in a second. But um, trans. Transporting waste is anything that, that happens over long distances, so anytime we have to transport goods or patients or uh, your bags to the air, airline, anything like that, that's just transporting waste. Inventory waste, so having more than what we need. Uh, motion waste, you know, any, any ergonomic type stuff, you know, at your workstations, if you're constantly have to go back and forth, bend, stoop, stretch, trying to get, uh, get uh, things you need. And it can also be, um, I guess, virtual motion. So when you have to click 50 times to get to the page that you want to get to, um, then that's going to be motion waste uh, in a virtual setting. People, people aren't a waste. It's just how we utilize people. So if we're not utilizing people to the fullest potential, you know, we got somebody that's a PhD in something and they're sitting out of the copy machine just running copies for eight hours a day. That's unused human potential. We're not really fully uh, utilizing their capability. Uh, waiting. Of course, that goes without saying. Overproduction, so that's producing too much, uh, too early. So I, I produce a thousand forms. When we use one a month, it's going to be a lot of years. Hopefully, that form doesn't get edited or revised. Um, Overprocessing, so that's your checks and rechecks and double checks. Um, and then, of course, a defect is a waste as well. Um, so the traditional approach to eliminating uh, waste, this is traditional process improvement, is um, we usually focus on bits of the process. Uh, so we focus on those green value-added steps and we, we think to ourselves in a typical world, we say, well, how can we you know, make these value-added steps shorter? You know, so we can have we can get more patients in a day, or we can do have more customers flow through our line a day. How can we make the checkout process faster? Um, of course, like we said, it's slow, difficult, often requires a lot of investment, um, incremental results. So, because it's focused on the 10% that's value added, but when, when the, in the lean world we focus on the 90% that's there, we focus on those red uh, bars. Um, so, by focusing on the, the uh, waste, um, it's of course faster, easier, lower cost, breakthrough results, because we don't even touch the value added stuff. We leave that alone because that's what the customer willingly will pay for. So 
so we'll leave that alone. And if we can enhance it, we'll enhance it. But other than that, we're going to completely ignore it and look at all the other waste in between to try to get those green bars as close together as physically possible. So that way we're delivering nothing but value to the customer every single step of their, of their stay uh, or whatever we're trying to do. So the good old toast video. So this is where um, that um, handout comes into play. So what we're going to do is we're going to observe or watch this video and we're going to try to identify all the little things that could be waste. So, and this is just making toast. So everybody makes toast at some point in their lives. So we're going to watch this and try to see how many things we can pick out that are waste. Uh oh. I don't know what that was. Seeing anything yet? Yeah. <laughs> so how many are already frustrated that he's not washing dishes? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Got a couple of things in the fridge. <laughs> I must own a dairy farm. I got like seven gallons of milk in there. is on by the way. go buy a new toaster. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. some butter on there. <laughs> I don't know if he washed his hands or not, but you know, maybe he's got some Purell or something. Close I love it.
love that video. <laughs> That's it. So what did you guys see? He, he went back and forth several times. Looks like he went first to get the bread, took, took the bread back, went back again to get butter. And he traveled back and forth several times to get supplies. Yeah. It's a lot of motion, motion yeah. waste. What else? He Waiting. Right. We didn't even ask the customer. We didn't even define what value uh, we were trying to deliver in the first place, and how many, and all those, all those other questions. Do you want butter or not? Um, so, what, what improvements would you guys make if it was you? You came in to do a Kaizen event. You're like, you know what? We're going to supercharge this toast baking process. What are some things that we would do? Yep. So rearrange the layout, make things flow. What else? Yeah, we're going to ask uh, what kind of toast do you want, how many slices, all that kind of stuff. Be productive during the waiting time. Yeah. Yeah, unused human potential is all over the place in that one, right? I mean, we're just sitting there with our arms folded with a sink full of dishes. So we did go through and we, we uh, made some improvements. We'll see how close. So remember, the first state was four minutes and 12 seconds to do this. What type of toast would you like? Okay, how many slices? That's what I'm saying. Very good. Oh, there's that bread next to the toaster. Jolly. Make it. Two minutes off of the, the total time. So we to see that time. He didn't wash his hands. <laughs> so opportunities for continuous improvement, right? So, th so that's kind of the approach, you know, and that's that's a real simple um, example of, of you know what we do every day in the lean world is uh, look for um, you know, all the waste uh, from the eyes of the customer and figure out well how can we eliminate that waste to make the process flow as much as possible, uh, and even doing the simple things, taking the butter out, having the, the bread and toast closer together, um, only doing one piece of toast versus four, so only having to have one side of the toaster on. Uh, um, cuts down on the uh, machine time um, for that uh, process. So, um, so we'll get into the lean cell, and, and we don't um, have enough time to go go into really uh, great detail on this. Uh, we spend usually about um, what two or three hours on each each little uh, section of this. So, so the, the pull, the standard work, so each of these would be three or four hours um, of training just on that one. So 
we don't have that much time and uh, we don't have that much coffee um, in the room either. Um, getting to the, the lean cell or flow cell, this is the ultimate, ultimately what we do. We want to create a process that is one by one or as simple as possible. We want it to be on demand. We want it to be the lowest cost um, and we want it to be defect. Um, so these are our um, what we're talking about. So a flow-based solution, so the one-to-one -one flow, um, is, is when large uh, waste are removed. So one, one item flow is the ideal state. So when we think of Subway versus McDonald's, this is where you start getting that easy batch versus flow mentality. So when you, whether you hate Subway or not, uh, when you look at McDonald's processes where if you order um, some fries, where are, the, where are those fries coming from? They're coming from a huge batch. You know, who, who knows how long they've been sitting in there? Who, unless you order them without salt, with a side of salt, you're going to get you know the batch of fries, or you're going to wait for the batch to be to be fried up for you. So in Subway, right, you go in, you you order the sandwich. They ask you what kind of bread you want. They ask you, ask you, ask you, every single step of the way, uh, what you want on it. Is that enough lettuce? Too much? Not enough? You know, salt, pepper, oil, and vinegar, uh, and so on. So that's kind of the flow, one to one, how it how it looks in the real world. You start one sandwich, go all the way down, start over with customer all the way down just keep continuous flow um, now um once you define that simple, easy approach, uh, the easiest process available, and you're flowing one by one, then we have to work on on delivering that value um, on demand or creating a pull system. So, pull systems are um, a lot of times communication triggers. They can be the tight connections between two work areas uh, if they have to work side by side. But we want to have the customer pull trigger the action. So, uh, pull systems are everywhere. Um, you know, we got a couple pictures here so pumping gas you know somebody doesn't just come by our houses and drop off you know five gallons of gas every couple of days I mean because that would that would be nuts I mean you or what I don't need the gas I don't drove anywhere in a few days so that's a pull system when you need gas it's there when you pull up you pull it um, same thing with the, the soda rack right I mean that's you pull one out the next one comes in it's ready to go um, so we want those to be between value-added items um, as much as possible. Um, standard work. Um, standard work is is the current best known way. So um, and it it doesn't mean that it's that way for for forever. Um, you know, if we figured out a really good way to do a process, you know, last week um, on Friday, but today we've got a better idea, um, then we're going to do that better idea. Um, and uh, all these things are, are definitely uh, cornerstones of, of flow and uh, basic enablers um, for um, continuous improvement. So each one of these um, are very important to uh, create and flow. And then we got 6S and uh, visual management um, is the last uh, cornerstone. Um, and that's where you know organization comes into play. Uh, we want things in the right places, so we want the visual tools. So you, by the the pictures up there, you see the the workstations with the printer, how they got uh, different items in different places, so you can see which items missing at a glance. Uh, the parking lot um, and the other picture with the uh, medical supplies. So if you walked in that supply room, you should be able to tell within a couple seconds if the piece of equipment's missing or not. Chart racks, you know, so what chart for which patient goes where, you know, so if you need to look for a certain kind of information, you'll go to that one place and it's there every time. ED tracking boards or tracking boards in general are another visual tool, but the, the point of, of 6S and visual management is to be able to see whether or not it's normal or abnormal, and if it's not normal, we take action and correct it. So that way there's not a lot of digging for information. We can see it uh, pretty much on demand. And the uh, 6S is the reason why it's called success is uh, those words up in the uh, top right corner so and those are also listed in order of um, how you do things uh, to clean up the area so you sort out what you need and what you don't need so kind of garage sale pile and keep pile uh, straighten up what's left so this is the items that we're going to keep so we're going to straighten those up set it to flow 
Um, we're going to scrub as we go, so we're going to dust, clean, mop, vacuum, all that kind of stuff. Make the area safe um, and free of any kind of hazards, and then we'll standardize that. So once we kind of come up with a model room or area, we'll standardize that and replicate it throughout. And then the visual management comes in with the sustainment piece. So it's it's a lot easier to sustain these these things because you know when that stapler is out of place, you know when that. Um, that chart's not in the right location either. So, um, and we're going to do a little um, 6S and standard work exercise um, as well. So we're going to use the same sheets of paper since we'll do it the least waste way. All you guys got to do is turn that over to the blank side. And we're going to do a, a real quick standard work exercise to kind of illustrate um, why standard work and visual management is so important. So the instructions uh, for this exercise, um, we're going to be writing some things down and we're going to pass it to our neighbors. Um, so what you guys are going to do is I want you guys to write the alphabet. But the only thing is, is um, in this first part, we're going to make it random. So you are to write random letters in random places um, and divide your sheet in two because we're going to do, do it twice. So the top half you'll use for this first pass, the bottom half you'll use for the second pass. Um, so we're going to write the alphabet. I'm going to give you guys 20 seconds to write the alphabet, but you cannot write A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It has to be B, X, F, just random letters. And you got to try to write the entire alphabet without putting anything side by side or in any kind of logical order. You'll have 20 seconds to do so, and then you'll pass it to your neighbor, and they're going to have to finish the alphabet for you. The same thing for you when you get your paper from the neighbor. All right, so everybody understand what they're doing? Good. Three, two, one, go. And pass it to your neighbor and finish the alphabet. <laughs> And stop. Who got finished? <laughs> Did you? Who got finished with zero duplications or anything? There's no duplicate letters on the paper. No, without looking, you can't look. You have to know that you did it defect free. There's no two A's, two B's, nothing. Nobody did it? Perfect. <laughs> All right, so, so what we're going to do now is we're going to put some standard work to it. So now what, we want, what I want you to do is write the alphabet. So we're going to write it A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, A. I'm going to give you half the amount of time. So you'll only have 10 seconds to start it, and you'll have you know, another 10 to finish it. Same rules apply, zero defects, no duplicated letters or anything like that. Ready, set, go. to your neighbor. And are we done? Who finished? Everybody finished? Zero defects? No duplicated letters? How do you know? Right, you just picked up where the other person left off, right? Unless, unless they played a little game on you and wrote it in random places. Um, so, so why is why was that so much better? We took half the time away, uh, number one, and then you know you knew immediately where to pick up. So why is that? Why was it so much easier with standard work and and, org and an organized way to do it? More logical. Yeah, I mean that's the way that's the way it should be, right? And that's standard work that's been put in place for years, right? So if we wanted to change the alphabet, that would be painstaking to do. But we would ultimately, if we put in a new piece of standard work, we'd have to all learn the new way, and then that would be just as easy as writing the alphabet, or just as easy as writing our name. Um, and the last couple of slides is just you know a kind of recap of, of what we went over today. So we will always in the living world we always seek to improve through. Um, 
continuously reducing waste, whether it be operational or service design. So we talked about operational, waste, but the design part is those design aspects on um, on a lot of times in technology. So you know your phones come with a lot of technology that you don't use or you find irritating uh, and just get in the way. Um, my clippy from back in the day that uh, was more irritating than anything. Product uh, design product design waste would be like your new Coke. Remember way back in the day when they came out with new Coke? That was a disaster. Um, who wants new Coke? I like Coke the way it is. I don't want a new taste. I want Coke taste. Um, and then, of course, what we talked about earlier this morning about the uh, unevenness and overburden. Um, overburden is that sticky note up there from an actual rapid improvement event that we did. It says, uh, no one else can do Cassie's job because it's so complicated. So is that respect for people when we write sticky notes like that? I mean, it's, uh, so that's why we do what we do. That's why we do uh, the Voss team. Uh, we, that's what gets us up in the morning to alleviate sticky notes like that. Um, and then the last slide I want to throw in there um, is the learning curve. So a lot of, basically everyone, uh, including myself, underestimates the length of the lean learning curve. Um, like I said, you can only really learn lean uh, by on-the-job training. You can't do it in a book or a classroom. It just it can't happen. Um, so if you spend a full week on a Kaizen event or a rapid improvement event, uh, improving a small area of operation, it will take you 12 weeks of on-the-job training uh, to get the basics down and lean. Uh, so that's 12 rapid improvement events to get a grade school education and lean. So you know how to spell it at that point. Um, if you continue to gain personal experience, full-time week-long doses, so full-time RIEs, it will take about 36 weeks to get a high school education and lean. So 36 rapid improvement events. Um, however, it will take about 60 weeks or more, uh, about five years, uh, for you to get a college education and lean. Um, and then by the time you institutionalize the behaviors um, uh, that are the foundation uh, for a new continuous improvement culture, it takes about 100 events um, and a decade of lean transformation experience to be a graduate uh, experience in lean. So, um, you know, we on the Voss team, I, I think I've done, I think it's like 37, 38, something like that, of either projects or RIEs, the week long doses. So, it's, it's going to take a while. I know, just like I said this morning, I know enough about lean to be dangerous, and that's about as much as I know because I got a long way to go. Um, but don't, don't underestimate you know, what it takes to really learn you know, this process, really learn this stuff because it takes uh, full immersion. Um, and then the last little bit, I, I touched on this this morning, but uh, the lean transformation is uh, leadership intensive. That's another lesson learned uh, from us at Mountain States is, is it's, it's very leadership intensive, um, much more so than anything else I've ever been exposed to and, and see. It's, uh, <laughs> threw that in just for you guys. So any questions or <laughs> comments or anything? Would you share, um, you know, you touched a lot on the theory behind lean. Would you share a, a personal experience where in the healthcare facility you all implemented lean and were able to uh, at least, I mean, uh, an RIE or some other event where you were able to eliminate some waste? Yeah, um, gosh, there's, we could pick any of them. Um, the most recent one that we did was the, uh, the trying to design a flow cell, um, the, the stuff that we talked about today, in the emergency department to try to uh, decrease the door to dock time. You know, our door to dock time, which is a little skewed um, as far as the reportable data because what's reported goes off of when the piece of paper is printed out of the chart. So that's assuming that as soon as that piece of paper is printed, the doc's going to see the patient, which we all know that's, that doesn't happen. So when we did an actual time study, it was, a, it was 77 minutes uh, between when you guys arrived at the door to when the doc finally got there to see you. Um, so what we wanted to do was create a flow cell, a care team flow cell, to where the doc, uh, nurse, PCP, and registration all 
kind of arrived at the same time, um, decreased all the duplication, duplicated steps, took a process that when done separately, I think it was 120 something minutes of actual process time, actual flow time. You know, when, when registration goes in and says there's spill, nurse goes in, does this, doc comes in later, reworks it all. Um, so 120 minutes, that process is now down to a total of, I think, 11 minutes. Um, so 120 to 11 um, of actual flow time. And then our door to dock time is five minutes. So, um, what, kind of, what kinds of things did you eliminate? If, I, mean, I don't want to get into much detail, but what kinds of things did you eliminate to, to reduce that time? That <laughs> Yeah, we in order in order to implement each of, of those aspects of the flow cell, it just it, it, it's a lot of a lot of work. So in the hour, I couldn't go into the amount of detail it takes, but just to create a simple process is is half the week in a in a Kaizen event. But you're talking about figuring out a way to design a process to where there is no waste at all. You know, there's no duplication, there's no defects. Um, we decrease the transporting and the waiting and the, um, the motion waste. We created tight connections between the care team. Since they weren't doing the processes in a segmented way anymore, they were all together. So they all heard the same information from the patient at the same time. So as the doctor was talking, registration is already typing in the bits and pieces of that conversation that they need to know. And then when the doc is done, registration's got, hey, let me have your insurance card. And okay, I'm done. Uh, the nurses start the IV and stuff like that um, afterwards, and, and then diagnostic imaging, X-ray, and whatever comes up after after that. So, yes. Uh, you mentioned in my life so that division is a waste of time, right? It's a waste. Uh, yep. You do one thing over and over. And over. Yep. But you can't get system. But division is an important process. So, do you think that? Yeah, and in in the lean world, it, it's about you know we don't want to just. I mean, where we run into trouble in the healthcare world is we have all these quality issues and we stop at the education communication piece, which forces us to put extra steps in the process to just double check someone else's work. When if we put a little bit more time and focus into the actual process, figured out a way to just error proof it, whether it was standardizing a form, standardizing a communication sheet from one person to the next, so that way we can pick up the alphabet where somebody else left off and we don't really make an error and starting at the wrong letter. You know, those those are the opportunities that we have in, in the lean healthcare environment. Um, certain scenarios, I mean pharmacy is probably one of our our biggest um, um, people that, that really stand firm on we have to check it a million times because we'll kill everybody in the world if we don't. Um, but, um, but, but if we just ask why a few more times uh, and find that root cause, we'll be able, maybe, maybe we don't know how to do it yet, but we might be able to find a root cause that we can do something about an error-proof process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Clear as mud? <laughs> What else? How do you prevent a relapse? So you described what you did in the emergency room and the dramatic block in the timing of the whole process. How do you institutionalize that change to where? Where it's just the new way? Go back to their old ways. Well, yeah, I mean, um, it takes um, probably, what, six weeks to, to form a habit. Um, it's it, Well, number one, I think it starts with creating an easy process. Um, and then number two, you have to uh, communicate the why. Uh, why is it important and, and, and why does it, who and why does it benefit um, that person? And in, in any environment, we, we don't like to flow. Um, you know, and that's it goes against everything that we learn and everything that we do throughout our whole lives. So, um, unless unless we're in a disaster situation, you don't really see people line up and from the grocery store door to your car and pass that exit and one by one flow because you know if, if we're making um, these bottles of water and I'm supposed to put the caps on and pass it to Zalipa for the label well I can put a cap on much faster than she can attach the label why would I want to wait on her to get done with the product before her and pass it on so she's free why wouldn't I just want to do as many caps as possible and just 
just fill up her workspace. So to me, it makes me flow better if, I, if I'm able to do that. But when I have to work together to coordinate tasks, it's harder and is not something I, I voluntarily want to do. So um, it takes a lot of sustainment. It takes a lot. That's where the leadership comes in. You know, leadership's got to be out there every single day, kind of harping on the process. We got to show the value of the new process. So when we have the data that matters, you know, when we say 77 minutes versus five, gee, which one would you want to do? Yeah, you got to give up a little bit of sitting at the at the desk playing on you know Facebook or whatever, but because everybody's going to come together and go at the same time. The boss has no uh, authority to uh, for accountability for these departments, so I guess that's kind of the wisdom of involving the departments, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, they'll have the better ideas, but number two, they'll have buy-in, and then they'll be they will then hold their departments accountable for those new processes, right? Yeah, yeah, we talk about it all the time um, with our team um, as soon as we. Um, Lay out or lay our cards out on the table, then we get lost. Um, you know, because from that point forward, it's it's the boss teams or that's the team and that's the team. Yeah. they don't do the work. Blah blah blah. I can't do the best thing. So they just don't want to do it because it wasn't their idea. Um, we have to lean, of course, um, teaching the questions. You know, the questions I ask, the answers I seek, and around to the concept of oh yeah you know it does work a little better and just continuously encouraging um, just let's see what happens when we try it um, don't say an experiment's not going to work because we can when four buses collide simultaneously and 74 people arrive at the ED at the same time this ain't going to work so let's not not do anything so we got to get rid of that um, doomsday prepper uh, mentality and just go with making the 80 per what happens 80 percent of the time uh, needs to flow seamlessly. What happens 20% of the time? I will figure it out later. We'll figure out what happens. So. Just blow you all the time. Alright, no more questions. That's, that's it. That's all you need.